those private service contracts they already got, those IT contracts, all these contracts they have got millions of dollars in private service contracts. Have they reviewed those first to see how they can get on those contracts? They need to look at those contracts before they start taking away people's jobs. I'm not familiar with, with what's out of house. Um, I know Mr. Bean is talking about the collection process taking it out of house. I remember privatizing collection years ago and never did they make a dent in collecting any funds. And I think he should keep it in-house with trained employees who work for the city. Because they, they started when they hired a company down in one new center one. They never collected on anything, significantly. And I think that um, we need to um, keep all our services in-house. Mr. Bean made a statement, and I'm sitting there. We're not in the business of providing jobs and service. I'm like, what planet did he get? This is the city. The city of Detroit, um, we always provide a city jobs. You're not giving anybody anything. People are working these jobs. The city needs these jobs. So, I'll give you a prime example. I met a young man on the campaign trail. He used to cut the grass on St. Jean, from St. Jean and Jefferson all the way down. They took the contract from him and gave it to that big grass cutting company. This young man, that's how he fed his family. Cutting that grass. Young father, he's 35 years old, no other basic skill set. That's how he fed his family. They took the contract and gave this company a million dollar contract. And when they cut the grass, they didn't even on the sidewalk, just roll the, roll the tractor over and keep going. This young man took pride in what he did. That was how he fed his family. He didn't have a formal education, he dropped out of high school, but he found a business that he can do. And he had it for, he said, for like eight years, and they called me and told me, well, don't have a contract. How fair is that? Why would you give one contract to a, a company out of the city and take it from a young man who was feeding his family? Detroit makes every business people wait for a year, a year or so for this. I've had friends that they go down there, they fill the paperwork out, they go back with the paperwork. They make them, they sit there and you wait hours to get someone to look at the paperwork. Then they tell you you have to go here. If you go to any other community, you can do most of that paperwork online. We're paying all these millions of dollars to CompuWare and everyone else, all these with IT. How come they can't do everything online? So, and then the inspector, whoever, the final paper come to your place of business, you sign the paperwork there. Why do you have to keep coming back downtown? It's not business friendly to the people who want to open business. So most of them open up in the suburbs so they can open and get their licenses and open up the shops. And that's one of the reasons many of them, my friends didn't open up their beauty shops or any other stores in the city of Detroit. They was like, oh no, I'm not going through that. They don't hurt the horse. Like, they said, oh, I'm not going through that. Then when you go downtown, I was there the other day for an hour and 41 minutes and I paid $16.41 to park. Then you have to pay the park. We're not... Um, business friendly. We got to make it business friendly where people want to come here. People don't want to come to Detroit right now. They open up everywhere else. Why do you think Kroger's didn't open up? Kroger's opened up. I, I was hoping they would open up in that old Farmer Jack, the new one they built on East Jefferson. They didn't open up because first they knew they were going to have police protection. They knew they was going to break in through the roof most of the time because we don't have that police presence. And they also knew they was going to have to go through all the you know, whatever you have to do to get those licenses. It's not our reputation, our image. It's all about image again. Our reputation, image. We have to streamline it. We have to um, make sure that we set up procedures where, as I said before, using technology. Being able to apply for those um, licenses and different permits online. And then have an inspector make it, you know, business friendly. Most communities, when the people sign their, um, the business owners sign their paperwork, the inspector comes to them with the paperwork to the place of business they're opening up. Make it more business friendly and more comfortable for a person to want to open a business here. I think we need to strengthen the ethics board. When we went through the events that occurred on Mayor Kilpatrick's um, administration, the ethics board was like, where's the ethics board? First of all, I think it should be an independent party. No, no one appointed by the mayor or the city council. 
I think it should be elected by the people. Then they gotta have something to work with. They gotta have some rules and some regulations. For instance, if a council person is suspected of taking a bribe, it should be automatically stepped down until you clear this matter up. If you're a police officer, you get suspected of taking a bribe, you're gonna step down, be suspended until the matter is cleared up, proving whether you're guilty or not guilty. And I, the ethics board, wonder, we really need to strengthen that because there's no no deterrent. You know, like in law enforcement, you have the law enforcement code of ethics. There is no deterrent for a person person sitting on city council not to be bribed or coerced into doing whatever you want to call it or taking monies and stuff under the table. And we all know that people come to them, you know, even with these endorsement process, people going to come back to them and say, oh yeah, you know, I endorse you. Can you look at this? Can you make sure? And that's something we need to strengthen here in, in the city of Detroit. That's the strongest thing. The ethics board. We need some Clear, they need some clear guidelines on how to they should react if, if things happen. Mm -hmm. I know police officers, there's certain rules and regulations. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. And that's what the ethics board needs. Yes, because you can't, I've found that you can't represent anything if you don't take ownership. I've driven along some of my neighborhoods and I live on the east side. And I'll see a dump and I'll say, well, all these people sitting here, they, I call, I call the ombudsman up, and it'll make the council people work harder in their district. They, they're accountable. If that dump is sitting on my corner, if you don't do anything about it, I'm going to vote you out the first chance I get. Or if I call your office many times and you don't respond and you don't um, clip the matter, then I know that I, I can hold you accountable. I was sitting down there, and we, he called us all down, and you know, they look and you know, he said, I know some of you, and I heard about some of you. I was like, okay, I guess you heard about me. Anyway, um, I believe David Cross asked him, oh, Mr. Mayor, are you going to take over Detroit Public Schools? He said, yeah, he looks at me. I said, excuse me, Mayor B, but as an educator, and I don't know the whole big table, I said, um, I am totally opposed to you taking over Detroit Public Schools. And there is a problem with Detroit Public Schools. I'm an educator, I know that. But we need a qualified superintendent who knows the mythology of teaching children, urban children, and turning urban school system. I said, look at Easter School District. I said, years ago, Easter School District had the same reputation as Detroit. I said, they brought in a young, innovative young superintendent. He's turned Easter School around and now he's on his way to Pontiac to turn that school district around. And then I asked him, I said, hey, Mr. B, are you advocating to take away our right to vote for school board? I said, the reason we get those people on the school board is the endorsement process. The same that I explained to you early. I said, now are you taking away my right to vote and the citizens? And he said, oh no, Miss Foy, I will never advocate to take away your right to vote. But if the people vote me in, I'll take over the school system. Everybody know we have the school system is in a shape, bad shape. But we need someone competent who know how to teach children. Mr. Bean or Mr. Bobby never stood in the classroom. I got kids in my classroom right now, 11th grader. When I asked him to write his name on his enrollment card, he wrote the first part of his name. And then 80, 90, and I had to sit down and say, honey, what street do you live on? And this is 11th grade. You, when you teach, you, you don't have kids from, from A to Z. And if you're never taught, you can put all these ideas down and say, oh yeah, we can do this, we can do that. No, you cannot. Because you have to deal with the children and where they are and what support system they got at home and where the failure came in. And that's one of the reasons why, yes, we got some serious, serious issues as far as our kids learning. But I, I'm not, I do not endorse the mayor taking up the school. You take the city, because in the other cities it's shown that the mayor, when the mayoral control is there, when the budget is short, they go into the school budget. Look how they did with the public library funds. They was taking their funds, using funds for the city budget. So what will prevent them from doing that? 